Okay, now it starts. Uh -huh. Okay. We begin back up with Jackson and the Indian problems. President Jackson was a veteran Indian fighter known as Big Knife. I've said to you he also has the nickname of Old Hickory. He has gained his fame not only from the Battle of New Orleans, not only from his fighting with the Seminole Indians and his being sent down into Florida under the Monroe administration, but he has for years out on the quote-unquote frontier been an Indian fighter, moving, dealing with the Indian nations as the Pioneers are slowly moving westward. We need to displace, we need to quiet, we need to solve the Indian problem so that the pioneers moving into that territory can have the land available to them and not have problems with the native populations um, scalping them, resenting them, attacking them. And so he has killed many an Indian in his time. So he is the great Indian fighter known as Big Knife. And he feels it foolish to regard the Indian tribes as separate nations within the individual states. On three separate occasions, the Supreme Court had upheld the rights of the Indians over the state of Georgia. Georgia has a very large area where the Cherokee Nation is occupying, and the state of Georgia wanted this territory for whites to grow cotton in, get rid of these Indians out of here. And three times the Supreme Court had said, no, that's the sovereign nation of the Cherokees there, and we do not have control over that. That is Cherokee tribe territory. Yet, Andrew Jackson had no regard for Indians. He'd been killing them for years. Jackson said, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. So John Marshall may have three times said the Indians are to be left alone, but how is John Marshall going to enforce it? Now, who is John Marshall? Remember, he's Chief Justice on the Supreme Court. Well, our system of government is based upon checks and balances, and it is based upon everyone respecting the checks and balances. The Supreme Court has judicial review. They are the ones who determine constitutionality and not. But the military power is the president's. He is commander in chief of the military. Now, at the same time, the president cannot go to war without asking Congress for war. He has to ask Congress, and Congress votes and says, yes, you may have war, or no, you cannot have war. At the same time, Congress cannot go to war without the president asking for war. We had in Vietnam, where Congress wanted war and basically gave the president point blank, you have war here. <laughs> and the president said, I didn't ask for war. Um, but that's a whole nother situation for another time. Um, but there are checks and balances. And here, three times the Supreme Court said, no, don't touch, hands off. And what you have here is President Andrew Jackson says, what can the Supreme Court do to me? I control the military. Exactly. John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Jackson forcibly 
uprooted more than 100,000 Indians in the 1830s. But before I get there, let me tell you about the Cherokee. We were just mentioning the Cherokee located here. The Cherokee were not a bunch of wild Indians. They were civilized Indians, as they are referred to. They had a written language. They had a constitution. Hello? Constitution. That's something that we understand as a government. They had a written constitution. They had a newspaper, all of this type of stuff. Sequoia was an Indian, Cherokee Indian. We even have a stamp representing him. And he created a written language for his people, an alphabet. And he goes down in history, as far as I understand, as um, I think the only person, I may be wrong in this, um, who has created an, a written language while being completely illiterate. Oops, sorry. Most people who create a language for their, for a language, at least know how to read and write another language. Um, um, but he had he couldn't read and write Spanish, he couldn't read and write English, he, he couldn't read and write any language. And yet he puts together and creates a alphabet, a written form for the Cherokee language. It is one that can be learned very simply, um, not that exhaustive of an alphabet. And they have a newspaper. Um, this is bilingual, you know, in one language, and then both English and um, in Cherokee. Here you can definitely see the Cherokee there. Um, this was the Cherokee Phoenix is the name of their newspaper. This issue is from 1828. This I picked up as um, a, a small little advertisement from one of the newspapers. Um, this is it written in Cherokee. Notice, I hereby forewarn all persons against crediting my wife, Delia, I'm not quite sure on the name there, Mick something, Mick, Mick, McConnell Neal or... Ah, I bet you it's that, McConnell, on my account as she has absconded without my consent. I am therefore determined to pay none of her accounts. So his wife has taken off. <laughs> and if she runs up any bills on my account, I am not paying them. So he's putting it in the newspaper to all merchants. Don't to take, let her put credit on my account. I'm not paying it. <laughs> but civilized nation and Cherokee, um, Sequoia, uh, well known. We have since named the huge thousand year old, 2000 year old trees out in California, uh, the redwoods, named after him, the Sequoia Redwoods. Five Indian nations that are forcibly removed the Cherokee, the Creek, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Seminole. They do not all take the same route. This is known, though, as the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears, though, officially is this one that comes up here through the north. Much of the um, traveling is done in the winter time that we know of as being such harsh traveling. 
Um, those that win in the summer obviously would not be as harsh as in the winter. Um, and those that came through southern routes, the weather is much milder. But this northern route that happened during the winter, this Trail of Tears, <clears throat> was the harshest of all. And at gunpoint, they are forcibly removed. And don't care what the Supreme Court says. We are moving you all out, and we are putting you in this territory, this Oklahoma territory, where we promise you can live forever and ever. Amen. We will never force you to move again. This land will be yours. Indian territory, we will never encroach upon you ever again. And some artist conceptions of the Trail of Tears. Once again, armed guards took them on forced march. If you couldn't keep up, you were simply left at the side of the road and the rest of the caravan was forced to move on. Those that went in the winter on the northern route, it was horribly bitter cold in the snow. There was inadequate clothing, and many of them had inadequate foot coverings. And it was said that um, the rocks and ice would cut their feet, and that sometimes... Um, after they had been walked through the snow, walked through an area, you would see spots of red in the snow after they had been driven through. And those were blood from their feet being cut by the rocks and the snow um, being left behind in this pathway left where they were taken through. Once again, I said as if they could not keep up, they were simply left behind and the group was moved on out. Yes, armed guards forced them, forcible removal. Incidentally enough, this man in some regards makes no sense. He is Big Knife, Indian fighter, Indian hater, and known for his Indian massacres in his earlier years when he would fight the Indian tribes. In one of the massacres, they had fought the Indians and then they had gone even farther in that afterwards they lit the whole village on fire to make sure everything was destroyed. Well, after the smoke was cleared, they hear this crying, and they go and find that this Indian baby had somehow survived. The mother had somehow managed to protect this child, and while the mother was dead, the baby had survived the massacre and fire. And they bring the infant child to Jackson and say, what are we going to do with this child? And Jackson says, give that child to me. And he takes it to the nearest fort and nurses it back to health and hauls that child back home to Rachel. And he and Rachel raise that child as if it were their own. They raised two sons that they took on that were not their own. He and Rachel never had any children of their own. They desperately wanted children, but they never had any children of their own. She talked one of her siblings into letting her have one of their son's baby boys um, because she said, you can have children and I can't. And they raised him and he died in adolescence. And then they raised this Indian boy 
I'm going to pronounce, pronounce his la name Lynn Coyer. I'm not exactly sure, but I think that's how you pronounce it, Lynn Coyer. They raised him also as their own until he died at the age of 16. And incidentally enough, um, Andrew Jackson, he died before he could accomplish this, but was actually trying to get Lynn Coyer appointed into West Point as a cadet. Had that have happened, he would have probably been the first Native American to have ever gotten into West Point. But here, <laughs> this great Indian hater raises this Indian child as his own son. Well, they were promised, if you will all move to Oklahoma, you We'll live there in peace forever and ever. Amen. We promise. But the government guarantees would go up in smoke within 15 years. Within 15 years, suddenly it is decided Oklahoma has value. We need Oklahoma. And thus ends the promise of you shall have that land forever. And... Moving on to the state, Mexican state of Tejas. In 1823, the Mexican government granted a huge tract of land to Stephen F. Austin with the understanding that he would bring in 300 American families. These immigrants were to be of the established Roman Catholic faith. Don't be bringing Protestants in. Mexico is Roman Catholic in faith. We want you to become properly Mexicanized. So you are to be of the Roman Catholic faith. You are to learn Spanish. You are not Americans coming here to remain American. You are to become Mexican citizens. And you are to not bring slaves. You are to become properly Mexicanized. Well, unfortunately, these restrictions were largely ignored. Stephen F. Austin does bring 300 families in. And most of those coming into Texas are Southerners who are coming in and continuing their way of life, the growing of cotton. It is not New Englanders rushing down here. It is not people from Ohio and Indiana rushing down here. No, it is people that are growing cotton that are continuing to come west. And they can they have no intention of becoming Mexicanized. They are intending on eventually becoming part of the United States. They intend on their way of life to continue the same as in the United States. They do not plan on becoming Catholic. They do not plan on learning Spanish, any of that. 1823, he is allowed to bring in 300 families. Does he do his job? Oh, does he do his job? By 1835, 12 years later, Americans numbered 30,300 families. 30 thousand in Texas. Most were law-abiding, but some of them had left the states only one or two jumps ahead of the sheriff. GTT, gone to Texas, became a slang term. To this day, GTT is still a well-known term. Now, in 1830, during this time period when they're all rushing to Texas, land in the United States cost about $1.25 an acre. While in Texas, ooh, what a difference. Mm -hmm, I'd rush to Texas too. And 
Americans rushed to Texas not only for cheap land, but to escape debts. And, hey, one step ahead of the sheriff. This is a whole different country. This is Mexico. If you are in trouble with the law, can the American law do anything against you if you are in Mexico? No, 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 no. Are most law-abiding? Yes. Are all? No. Friction between the Mexican government and the Texans rapidly increased over the issue of slavery, immigration, and local rights. In 1835, this is only 12 years after Austin has been told, bring in 300 families. 12 years later, dictator Santa Ana wipes out cherished rights guaranteed by the Mexican Constitution of 1824. Our Constitution had been in existence for quite a few years now. We were used to not having constant changes. We had had so far 12 changes to our Constitution. The first 10 had come in immediately, and then two had come in since. Well, now Santa Ana, whoosh, he just makes wholesale changes to the Constitution of 1824 that they had come in under. Early in 1836, the Texans therefore declare independence. And the original one, of course, would have been handwritten, but here is a copy, uh, a printed copy of the Texas Declaration of Independence and, of course, the uh, signatures of those who signed and artist's conception of the meeting and signing of the Texas Declaration of Independence. Sarah, hush, background singing there. They unfurl their Lone Star flag with Sam Houston as commander in chief. And this particular statue of Sam Houston, I am hoping for many of you, is something that you recognize. This statue you will see right off the side of the road if you are going up 45, right outside of Huntsville. Just a sec. Sarah! Hush! Santa Ana now as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, do I have Santa Ana here? No, I don't have Santa Ana. I had just a second ago here. There, yes, Santa Ana. He is General Santana, and he always considers himself to be quite the Generalissimo, and he always knows what the best strategy is, and no one will ever challenge him and he accept their opinions. He now moves into Texas with 6,000 men at the Alamo in San Antonio. And right here, this red dot shows the Alamo in San Antonio. 200 Texans were wiped out to a man after a 13-day siege. I want you to note here, see the um, purple versus the green? The state of Tejas was a state of Mexico. Um, back when I showed you that map here earlier, Mexico had states just like we had states, and it had the state of Tejas. Um, eh, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, 
So he moves up into what then was the state of Tejas. And first encounter with the American settlers who were supposed to be Mexicanized but were not takes place at the Alamo. Two hundred Texans are there, and after a thirteen day siege, their commander, Colonel W. B. Travis, declares, I shall never surrender nor retreat. Give me victory or death. And unfortunately, what he gets is death. The victims included some very famous names, Jim Bowie, from which we get the very famous Bowie knife, a type of um, large hunting knife. He had actually been injured a couple of, very severely injured, a couple of days earlier and had great internal injuries and was unable to even be up fighting, could not stand on the wall to even shoot. He was laying on a cot, um, and he said, you know, I can't even stand and fight, but give me two revolvers. And when he was found, of course, shot dead on the cot, there were, though, he was, though, surrounded by dead bodies. Um, yes, I'm going to be taken out, but I'm going to take out as many of them as I can as well. Um, I read a book on him, and he claimed that his original Bowie knife that he had made by a special um, blacksmith was made from a meteorite. And it was particularly hard, um, the metal, the material that the knife was made out of because it was made out of a uh, meteorite. And it was very, this craftsman was very good craftsman. And just the balance and everything that of the way it held in the hand, it was just an, a, a superb knife. And um, other knives were made after the style, but of course did not have the meteorite blade. Davy Crockett um, also died at the Alamo. He had actually served in Congress briefly, and if I do remember correctly, uh, his political career was ended by Andrew Jackson in a rather vicious move by him and his people on their part to um, pretty much put an end to Davy Crockett's um, political career. But he dies also at the Alamo. If you ever get a chance to go to the Alamo, we see artist conceptions of this grand place such as this. And so when you go, please do not be disappointed. What it is today is very different <laughs> than what it was then. There are six foot to uh, six foot, six story buildings all around it um, in the middle of downtown San Antonio. And so you're surrounded by these tall buildings and you come around the corner and here's this little teeny <laughs> building. And it's like, oh, um, inside you can get a tour. Um, the original church is still there and they will show you bullet holes in the walls. And down this side they have some storage rooms. It's been a couple of quite a few years since I've been there. I can't remember if those are original to the building or if they have built those since as um, what 
they would have looked like um, back in the time, but I know that this is original building. But no, um, what it looks like in the movies and in all the pictures, this is about all that um, remains of the original. We do have, though, famous Alamo Monument, one side of it, another side of it. Of course, we've got Davy Crockett and Travis. The cost was horrific, except for some women and children that had um, holed up in the Alamo. All of the um, soldiers, every last one of them, um, died. Um, the cost, though, to the Mexican army was horrendous. And the other military advisors and generals that had come up with Santa Ana, they begged him and said, no, 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 you know, there are better ways for us to do this. Why don't we try this? Why don't we try that? And Santa Ana absolutely would not listen to them. No, we are going to do this frontal attack. And da -da 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 -da. Yes, they won. Um, but had they have listened to his generals, they could have had far less casualties than they had um, attacking this band in a fortified position as they were. Well, the next attack takes place at... Goliad right down here. A band of 400 Texans, having heard of what happened at the Alamo, they threw down their weapons, they surrendered, and the Mexicans massacred them once they are have all their weapons taken away. They've surrendered. They think they're going to be captured, dealt with as prisoners of war. No, Santa Ana says, butcher, kill every last one of them as pirates. Now, I have a little question on that. You're on land. How do you execute them as pirates? Hmm. Well, <laughs> If you fight to the death at the Alamo, you're going to get killed. If you surrender, you're going to get killed. Texas War Cries. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the Goliad Monument here. Yes, got to have a monument. Um, Texan War Cries became Remember the Alamo, Remember Goliad, and Death to Santa Ana. They sweep through the United States and sweep us into a frenzy. Many Americans rush to aid their relatives in Texas. Now, which Americans rush to aid their relatives in Texas? Is it New England? No, it is mainly fellow Southerners, because it was the Southerners who went into Texas. And I have a Far Side cartoon for you. I love Far Side. Half of them I get. Half of them are even beyond me and I have trouble with them. But uh, Christmas morning, 1837, Santa Ana's son Juan receives the original Davy Crockett hat. Get it? Huh. <laughs> oh, that's so good. On April 21st, 1836, Houston, with a band of about 900 men, attacks at San Jacinto. We've got Houston over here, and not Houston the man, but Houston the city currently today. And here we've got San Jacinto. Um, Battleship Texas, many of you in middle school or high school may have done a field trip, Battleship Texas and San Jacinto or some such a thing. Hopefully you've gone out and visited San Jacinto. In the meantime, um, 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 um,
Sam Houston uh, was not at the Alamo. Sam Houston was not at Goliad. And he is wandering around trying to find the correct time to engage with Santa Ana. And the Texans are getting very annoyed at him. And they are pressing him and they are pressing him. And they are about ready to fire him because he is not engaging. But he wants to make sure that when he does engage, it is not going to be a slaughter of his men. It's going to be a correct situation. And he finally finds the correct situation here at San Jacinto. Santa Anne is gathered here with his men. He's got about 1,300. And Sam Houston has 900. So once again, Santa Anna has the um, superiority when it comes to manpower. <clears throat> the grass is tall here. It is April, um, about two, two and a half foot, maybe even up to three foot high grass. No one has mowed the grass, you know, it's in its natural state. And the army of Santa Anna has already been there first. They're encamped, they've had their lunch. And they are all got their tents there, and they are taking siesta. It's a warm afternoon. Um, you take siesta. And Sam Houston has his men get down on their bellies, and they are crawling as quiet as they can, getting as close as they can without being seen or heard to the enemy camp. They are all sleeping. We don't want them to know we're coming. When they get to within 300 feet of the camp, then they all jump up, scream, roar, blow their horns, run as fast as they can towards the enemy camp. They are making wild charge, and these people are just coming out of their tents, waking up to what in the world is going on. And here comes these 900 men with their muskets, their rifles, their pistols, their bayonets into camp as these guys are pulling their heads out of their tents. It is mass pandemonium. <sighs> yes, there is fighting going on, but it is chaos. And very quickly, the lesser numbers of Americans take control of the battlefield. And we begin rounding up the Mexican troops and trying to create encampments of them, taking their weaponry away and putting patrols around them while we um, fight and collect more and put them in encampments. And we are desperately looking for Santa Ana. And this, of course, is an artist's conception of the Battle of San Jacinto. And we cannot find... Santa Ana, because he's, you got to find the guy in charge to make all your negotiations with. And we're, as we capture these people and are throwing them into the encampments, um, we find this little guy in a private's uniform who's crawling through the grass trying to hide and get away. And we throw this guy into the encampment with all the other Mexican soldiers, and that suddenly they all go, ah, oh, el capitan, and we're thinking, why are they all saluting and going el capitan to this little private, and finally we get to figuring out this is not some little private, this is Santa Ana, to save his own skin, he has taken off his um, uniform and put on one of a private and is sneaking through the grass trying to escape. Well, of course, confronted with Bowie knives, he is forced to sign two treaties. 
first agreeing to the withdrawal of Mexican troops, and second recognizing the Rio Grande as the extreme southwestern boundary of Texas. First of all, here we have Sam Houston. He was um, injured badly in the leg during this battle. After the battle, he will actually have to go to New Orleans. And here he will spend several months convalescing because of this rather grievous wound that he will receive in this battle. And here you have Santa Anna in his little private's uniform. Um, first of all, yes, you've won. I will withdraw. Um, you are independent. And secondly, hang on, let's get back to our map. That southern boundary, when the state of Tejas was part of Mexico, the southern boundary had always been the Nueces River. No, 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 no. The Texans say, no, 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 we want the Rio Grande to now be the southern boundary. Well, you can make your southern boundary wherever you want it to be, as long as everyone agrees to it. Well, they said everyone agrees to it. It's on the paper, and Santa Ana signed it. Why do I mention this so? Because this is partly what will lead into the Mexican-American War. Where is the southern boundary? Santa Ana will say it never has been the Rio Grande. It has always been the Nueces. And yet the Texans said, we made you sign on the dotted line that is the Rio Grande. Well, why does he not agree to that? Because as soon as he is released, after having signed those two documents, he repudiates both of them. And he says they are both signed under duress, and I don't agree to either one of them. Once again, another battle, and we have a monument. If you have ever been out there and gone to the San Jacinto Monument, they have a museum in the bottom that you can go through. And I'm trying to think. I don't know if there is a fee for the museum, but there is definitely a fee if you want to go to the, up the elevator and see the view. Quite a view from up um, in the elevator. But they do have museum here at the bottom. The Mexican government was very upset at the United States for their aid to the rebellious Texans. They let the United States know that if we were to annex Texas, that it would be considered an act of war against them, as Texas was a state in revolt and not viewed as independent by Mexico. Remember, Santa Ana had revoked that two treaties that he signed. He says, mm -mm, Texas is in revolt and we intend on coming and recapturing her. So don't you put your eyes on her. Don't you look, don't you get tempted? Absolutely not. Um, Texas um, was a very choice morsel and asked immediately to become a state of the union. That's what she'd always intended. Yes, um, but um, shockingly enough was denied by Uncle Sam because of the slavery issue. Northern states did not want slavery expanding, and Texas intended on entering the Union as a slave state. It would not be until another nine years later that Texas would finally be admitted into the Union. The jilted Texas pride was left in a very dangerous predicament, fearing the return of the Vill villain Santa Ana. She was forced to maintain a very costly military establishment. She couldn't just sit there in peace. No. Mexico was constantly threatening to take her back and actually did make two half-hearted half raids into Texas in 1839 and in 1840. Britain 
was also intensely interested in an independent Texas to stop the southward surge of the United States. In addition, British merchants regarded Texas as a potentially important free trade area to offset the tariff-walled United States. British manufacturers likewise perceived that those vast Texas plains constituted one of the great cotton-producing areas of the future. Uh, let's go back to the map. So, well, this isn't enough of the map, but um, they had been getting cotton from the South. Um, but anytime the United States wanted to put tariffs on the price of cotton or wanted to change the rules, this was such a huge supplier of cotton to England that she was stuck. Um, she couldn't say no. She needed this cotton. You always want to have a secondary source that you can go to. Well, here suddenly is a secondary source. It is not part of the United States. Whatever tariffs the United States had didn't apply to Texas. The price for a bale of cotton in the United States was not the price for a bale of cotton in Texas. Everything could be different. You could negotiate prices um, against each other. This is a second source. This is fabulous for England. And it would keep the United States from pushing further westward and southern more southerly across the continent. So England, in particular, was very interested in an independent Texas. It would relieve British looms of their fatal dependence on the American fiber, a supply which might be cut off in time of crisis or embargo or war. Texas understandably went so far as to flirt openly with Britain and France for support. Well, why not? She asked to come into the Union, and we told her no. She never knew when Mexico would attack again. She needs help. Why not flirt with France and Britain? An ugly situation involving balance of power politics began to develop below the underbelly of the United States. Can we tolerate this? No. Do we want England above us in Canada and England below us in Texas? No. It could not be allowed to go on indefinitely, and it would not. We will solve this during the Polk administration. But for now, we will cover Andrew Jackson, the man. End of his presidential term. And Andrew Jackson was a young man when the American Revolution took place. The last president to be born a British subject. The next president, Martin Van Buren, will be born a U.S. citizen. And he <coughs> had some very bad experiences with the British and so very early on learned to dislike them. Um, he was captured and while captured and in this house, a British officer demanded that he clean his muddy boots, and this impertinent young lad refused to clean this officer's boots. And so the officer was going to teach this young lad a lesson. I'm sure he meant to kill this kid, this snotty little sass. And he raised his sword to swash, to <laughs> slash him one good one. And to save his life, Andrew Jackson raised his hand 
and the sword came smashing down on his hand, pushing his hand down with such force that it not only sliced across the palm of his hand, but also put a scar on his forehead. And these um, scars he carried on his body for life. Um, he hated the British his entire life from this point on. A ship's figurehead, um, sort of like a masthead, carved out of wood. And if you don't know who Andrew Jackson is, you do not look at your money. The Hermitage. I picked this up when I visited his home in Nashville, Tennessee. Some paintings of Andrew Jackson. And man, this guy had hair. To the day he died, this guy had hair. None of those bald New England Adamses. Early life, mainly military. Yes, he had some political life, but his political life would mainly come as his two terms as president. Battle of New Orleans. Artist conception. And one of the ribbons um, from his funeral commemorating his Battle of New Orleans. The camera, or dear, oh, I'll never pronounce that correctly, dear, dear, Geography. Um, oh, do I have it written in here? No, I don't have it here right now. Um, old type of photography. Dear, oh shoot! But um, this type of glasses. I was trying to look it up and couldn't find much on it online. But it's. I would assume it must be almost like a bifocal where you get a second lens that you could pop in over this for things up close. So, very interesting. His wife, Rachel. Oh, but his beloved Rachel. Never had children of their own. And the Hermitage. He always wanted to build her a grand house. By the time he finally built her the Hermitage, uh, it was rather late in life. And on the property is family graveyard and Andrew Jackson's tomb. Inside the home. I had mentioned, I think, with the, one of the other presidents, um, wallpaper. Only the very rich had wallpaper. And cool, cool staircase. Does not seem to have any supports. Unfortunately, we arrived at the Hermitage uh, like about a half hour before they were closing. Same thing as um, Mount Pelier, um, which was um, James Madison's home. And so they let us in, didn't charge us, let us run around the place. But I couldn't get in to see anything, had to just look through the windows and picked up postcards. That's why I have <laughs> these pictures. So next time I'm through Nashville, I'm going to get there in time to actually go into the Hermitage. Um, so just have inside pictures here from postcards. 
his bedroom. I am assuming all this fancy stuff and drapery was for winter time. Um, and to make it dark, you would pull the drapes, but to try and keep it warm in here during the winter, you would pull drapes to keep um, it warmer. Uh, the kitchen is actually a same as Mount Vernon and all, a separate little building house um, outside of the hermitage. The last thing you'd want was to set the big mansion on fire while cooking. Advertisements for runaway slaves. He owned slaves all during his um, lifetime once he became wealthy enough to own slaves. These two are different advertisements for slaves. This one is this one written in a more, this one is so that you can read it better. Um, Stop the Runaway $50 Reward. Eloped from the subscriber, living near Nashville on the 25th of June, last a mulatto man slave, about 30 years old, five feet, and an inch high, stout, made, and active, talks sensible, stoops in his walk, and has remarkable large foot broad across the root of the toes will pass for a free man. I am informed he has obtained by some means certificates as such. Took with him a drab great coat, dark mixed body coat, a ruffled shirt, cotton homespun shirts and overalls. He will make for Detroit through the states of Kentucky and Ohio to the upper part of Louisiana. The above reward will be given any person that will take him and deliver him to me or secure him in jail so that I can get him. If it taken out of the state, the above reward and other reasonable expenses paid and $10 extra for every hundred lashes any person will give him to the amount of 300. Not a nice man you are, Mr. Andrew Jackson. And death of gentleman Andrew Jackson. His wife had died before him. So these would just be relatives and kin, because he had no children. Another artist conception. And the stamps, very famous president. And here we have his hermitage. His very big home. And thus ends Andrew Jackson. Thank you.